Oh, it's also one of the most rapidly warming regions of the planet uh, because of its proximity to South America and also the Antarctic circumpolar current shallows along its coastline and that's warming. So unbeknownst to me, when I went there 20 years ago, I didn't realize that I was living in a place that's going through these amazingly rapid changes. That's what I want to talk about with you today. And we've frozen up again. All right, whatever you did yeah. before. <laughs> It's because it's a year's Antarctica, it freezes. All right, so we know about warming. We know that if you went back uh, about 15, 20, well, 17 years ago uh, in National Geographic, you would see this kind of an image where it was very Arctic centric where we were looking at warming on the planet. And this largely was because we hadn't really looked at the data very closely. And if you do, in fact, go and look closely at the station data we have on the ground and satellites, it's not just the peninsula that's warming, but the western portion of the entire continent. And remember that this continent is huge. It's the size of India and China combined. OK, so this is a very large landmass. So um, essentially, what we have then is an area that uh, is warming so fast that we now have temperatures that are just incredibly warm happening uh, during the austral summer on the northern portion of the peninsula, uh, even up into you know the the 60s, sometimes 60 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, so it turns out that if you start to look then at ice shelf melting, now ice shelves are these thousand foot thick ice features that are attached, they're floating in water, but they're attached to the continent. And here you have ice shelf melting because of the warming of the Antarctic circumpolar current, the largest current on our planet, um, that's warming uh, largely because of anthropogenic climate change. And you can see that the eastern side of the continent is also showing ice shelf melting. So it's not just a Western phenomena that is occurring. So how much warming is happening in my backyard uh, at Palmer Station? And it turns out we're really lucky that the Ukrainian station there, about 20 miles from us, uh, in addition to making an absolutely stunning vodka, they, uh, <laughs> they also uh, essentially have been taking air temperatures for 60 years or more daily. And if you plot the midwinter air temperatures over 60 years, the increase is about 10 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, for those temperatures. So this is the equivalent or maybe even slightly more than what you hear about happening in the Arctic. So what does that mean? Um, it means that the glacier behind our station, the Mar Glacier, uh, unlike 20 years ago when once or twice a week, you would hear a huge crashing sound and you'd run down the hall and look out at the bay and watch the waves go by and you and your colleagues would get excited. It was a big deal. Now, when I was there about a year and a half ago, uh, we're looking at this happening four, five, six times a day. So the sound of the ice crashing has become normal in the station. You don't get up from your desk and run down the hall to look at the waves anymore. And this is indicative of what's happening all up and down the Western Antarctic Peninsula. About 87% of the glaciers are receding uh, because of this rapid warming. We also know that the glacier is receding because we measure it. Uh, this is a science technician who once every few years uh, I bribed to go out and do a day-long hike with a GPS unit in their backpack, uh, talking to a satellite overhead and tracking their position. And in 2017, it's time for me to get them to do it again. Uh, this is where the glacier line was. You can see where it was back in the 60s and 70s when UAB's Dr. Amsler and Maggie Amsler uh, used to go down uh, to the station in the early days. And Maggie said you could open the door of the station and almost step onto the glacier. And now you have to hike a half a kilometer to get to the edge of it. So it just gives you a sense of how rapidly the recession is going on. Here you can see where it was in 1975, right next to the station. And then in 2013, how much recession has occurred. Um, so we also have instruments now where we can measure glacial ice thickness and thinning that's going on, which I find quite remarkable. Uh, Satellite-based instruments that to an accuracy of about a centimeter can measure the thinning of glacial ice. This sort of reinforces what I talked about that the Western side of Antarctica is undergoing the most rapid changes in the peninsula, not as much on the East. And then look at Greenland. Look at Greenland in the Northern hemisphere. Uh, one of the most rapidly uh, 
melting glacial systems, ice sheet systems uh, on the planet. And it's also like Antarctica playing into sea level rise issues. Now, this was a big surprise to scientists and still is a major focus of research. There are a variety of countries that have located their ships off of the Thwaites Glacier to study it. It turns out that the Thwaites Glacier over on the western part of the continent, well below the peninsula, is essentially a sort of a kingpin. Uh, it is the cork, the, the metaphorical cork that is holding back the movement of the West Antarctic ice sheet that's moving seaward. So remember, I haven't said this, but Antarctica is covered with a couple mile thick ice. The entire continent is where 80% of our fresh water on the planet is locked. Um, that ice is not stationary. On the west side, it's moving to the west, on the east to the east. And the, the Thwaites Glacier is sort of a funnel where that western ice sheet would enter the ocean. So the concern is that the Thwaites Glacier is receding remarkably fast. Um, really quite orders of magnitude more than you'd expect fast. And, and that's partly because there's water underneath it, and that's helping to melt it. Um, so this is a big concern. It would play into whether there's a meter or two of sea level rise with the, you know, in the next couple of centuries. This is, this is really something. Um, the ice shelves themselves along the western Antarctic Peninsula have been breaking up. And this is sort of a map of what the breakup has looked like over the last, say, 40 years. Just highlight a couple of them. The Larsen B ice shelf uh, began to break up. You can see this image of striation back in 2002 in the ice. And then about a month later, the satellite image shows it's beginning to break up. And two weeks later, it went out to sea. So this is a piece of ice the size of Rhode Island. Uh, remember, it's about a thousand foot deep ice. So it's a big amount of ice. Um, more recently, uh, in 2017, a chunk of the Larsen Sea ice shelf showed a big crack. Uh, we followed the crack on the evening news for a couple of months. And sure enough, eventually this piece of ice the size of Delaware floated away from the Larsen Sea ice shelf. At that moment, it was one of the largest icebergs that had ever been recorded in human history. Um, so these features are large, but they are of less concern to us when in terms of global impact, because the ice in ice shelves is floating in the ocean. Um, it doesn't have any effect as it melts on sea level rise. It's the same physics as your glass of ice water. When the ice in your glass melts, the water doesn't come over the top of the glass onto your desk. It stays at the same level. So it's the same idea. However, the concern is that ice shelves are barriers to the ice sheets behind them. And when they disappear, the rate of flow of the ice sheet into the ocean is accelerated up to four times, and that this does result in sea level rise. So right now, Antarctica are, is a major player in sea level rise by the end of the century. Greenland as well, um, you know, anywhere from a third to a full meter of sea level rise uh, is significant if you think about it and you happen to have real estate in Florida on the coast. Um, so what are the impacts of these changes in the ice on wildlife that populates the Antarctic Peninsula? It's been a real joy to get to know and work with Bill Frazier, who's in the back of this National Geo photo. Bill came down to Palmer Station as a grad student uh, back in the 70s, mid 70s. And for his doctoral project, he tagged 16,000 breeding pairs of the Delhi penguins. That's a big doctoral project. And then more of uh, more significance, he's came, come back every year for 45 years to follow the population. Uh, and tag new animals that are born. And essentially he knows the demographics of this population better than anybody in the world. Uh, unfortunately, the, his penguins, which are shown here in the purple line, Bill's penguins, um, are disappearing. The Adelis have disappeared to the extent of about 90% uh, of them now. Um, he told me the 2021 data just came out and they're down to a thousand pairs that are left. So about 90% gone. At the same time, you can see that the penguin in the middle picture, the Gen 2, showed up in the 90s and is actually now numbering in several thousands of breeding pairs. Um, and then the chin strap came in the 70s 
uh, earlier, but the numbers are pretty small. There's, I guess, three or 400 breeding pairs of chinstrap penguins. So these are the three common brush tail penguins. If you come to Antarctica with me, I can guarantee you you'll see all three of these species. They, they're quite abundant. Right, Paul? Yeah, you get to see every single one of them. Um, so the question, of course, is what are these penguins doing? Why are these two other species moving in? Well, they're warmer weather penguins. And as the peninsula is warming, they're finding it quite attractive. And they're moving down and they're actually moving into some of the nests of the Adelis that are abandoned. And the question is then what is happening to Adelis? And it turns out it's related to climate change. Um, it's getting warmer. It's getting more humid. It's snowing more and later than it used to because of the moisture in the air. And what happens is the Adeli comes in genetically programmed to lay its eggs in a particular week and boom, the eggs are all laid. And then along comes these unseasonable snowstorms that bury the colony. And sadly, when the snow melts, the eggs don't survive. So you can lose an entire generation at one fell storm event. Um, this is happening more often. And then also very important is the sea ice is receding. And I haven't told you about sea ice, it's extremely important in Antarctica, particularly to the biological systems. Um, Antarctica doubles in size every winter <clears throat> because of the sea ice that forms around it. Sea ice is not a thousand foot deep ice. It's about five to six feet thick. And it breaks up during the spring and it disappears in the summer. And then it forms again in the fall and it's around during the winter. And it's very predictable. And so there are a lot of animals in Antarctica, marine animals, who become dependent on the sea ice, the ebb and flow. We call them sea ice dependent species. The Adeli penguin is one of them. What they do is they use the platform that the ice provides as a mechanism of tobogganing across on their bellies out to the areas where there's a lot of food. They are feeding on krill, little shrimp. Um, and with the sea ice disappearing, Bill thinks that they have to put a lot more energy into swimming offshore than they used to, and that's having an impact on their ability to have an energy level sufficient to raise their chicks. The other thing that's uh, challenging the Adelis and many organisms is that uh, krill, these quintessential shrimp-like animals that form the base of the food webs, um, are associated with the sea ice. When they're teenagers, they live under the sea ice, feeding on little plants called diatoms. So as the sea ice is de being depleted, you potentially are gonna have impacts on krill populations as well. And so that would have an impact on the Adeli and may already be happening to some degree. Now there is a little good news. I'm all about good news too. Uh, good news about the Adeli is that we have discovered, scientists have discovered, a population of Adelis living on the danger islands up around the northern tip of the peninsula where it is significantly colder than the population that's disappearing. Think of it as kind of a, a repository for the future. Um, they're protected for the time being by the very cold weather. Eventually they will be challenged. They thought that there were perhaps several hundred thousand, there are actually millions, several millions of Adeli penguins on the danger islands where nobody could get because that's what they're named, the danger islands. And they finally got in with some remote uh, drones. They could fly drones across and use them to do a count. And that's where they discovered that they're abundant. So other organisms in the system that are could be affected by warming and the, particularly the krill populations declining are baleen whales. Um, the good news about the whale populations in Antarctica is despite the krill issue, the populations seem to have finally reached a level post whaling to sustain and grow themselves for the first time. So in a single afternoon a couple of years ago, I counted 55 humpback whales in a single afternoon off the side of the ship. Um, humpback whales in particular seem to be doing well. So whaling is the, the lack of whaling took a hundred years for recovery, but now it seems to be that the populations are doing much better. They're certainly not at the levels they were before whaling, but they are getting to be healthier. Uh, one of the real fun things is to come across bubble feeding and bubble feeding is where these humpbacks go down and they blow bubbles in a concentric circle. They make a cylinder of bubbles, scares the krill into a ball, 
And then the whales take turns diving underneath the cylinder of bubbles and coming, shooting up through them with their mouths open to catch all the krill. And then what's fun for us is they come out of the ocean and we're looking down off the side of the ship at the mouth open, the baleens sieving the krill all in front of you. You can even smell the, the bad breath that these whales have. Uh, it is absolutely stunning. Other animals impacted by the sea ice changes, uh, the Waddell seal is a sea ice dependent species that uses its teeth uh, as chipping mechanism. Um, the female has a special dentition, not the male. And when she's pregnant, she swims up under the sea ice and uses her ice chipping teeth to create a breathing hole. And then she hangs out long enough to create a hole large enough that she can climb right up through the hole, lay next to it and give birth. And the beauty of this is that her pups now are sequestered away from the leopard seals and the killer whales that are at the edge of the ice that would challenge or threaten her young. And it's all because of her dentition. It's really a fantastic evolution. Um, I don't think that these seals will disappear like the Adelis are. I think they're more apt to follow the retreat of the sea ice. Maybe they'll go to shore and give birth. They never have before, uh, but we don't know. Another species that uses sea ice as a part of their life history is this beautiful leopard seal, which when we see when we're scuba diving, uh, we drop a siren into the water to alert the divers immediately, get them up out of the water as fast as possible and into the boat where they are safe because these are very territorial predators up to a, a thousand pound, 10 foot long seals. And we don't wanna take any chances with them but they are beautiful animals and they've only ever been seen giving birth on the sea ice. And so the thought is, you know, are they going to follow the retreat of the ice or are they gonna to go to shore? There's nothing to really threaten them on shore and they are going to shore more often, but still nobody has seen any birthing on shore yet. So we don't know exactly what's gonna to happen to that pattern. Um, the warming is also impacting the plankton communities. So the little things that live in the water, the little plant cells called phytoplankton and the zooplankton that feed on those, very important in the ecology of Antarctic oceans. Um, we have a program called the Long-Term Ecological Research Program funded by NSF that sort of serendipitously uh, was funded long before climate change was on the radar along the peninsula. And so they've got this great database of plankton sampling that's gone on for 35 years. And you can see here the track that the ship takes every year on this six week cruise. When, you, uh, when they go up and down these transect lines sampling phytoplankton, zooplankton, water chemistry, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's a very large database. It's, it's a huge database. And when uh, I asked Hugh Ducklow, the director of the program, to put all of that data into a single slide. I didn't think he could do it, but he did. And so basically the storyline is that the entire peninsula is moving from a polar climate to a warm, humid subantarctic climate. And if you look at the two cartoons on the top, you're comparing the 70s and 80s with the 90s and 2000s at the tip of the peninsula, the change in the weather is profound. Uh, we're going to cloudy, windy days, days where the wind actually churns the top of the ocean enough that the phytoplankton are getting pushed down into the water column. And some of them are challenged because there's not enough light for photosynthesis. And some of the better species of phytoplankton that the krill like to eat are disappearing and we're losing some krill as a result of that too. And in the midst of all this, the salps have arrived. Salps are more oceanic. They're little gelatinous organisms, um, tunicates, if you will. They're about the size of a walnut. The nutrition of a salp is a, is a head of lettuce compared to krill, which is steak. So it's not a good trade-off between the krill disappearing and the, and the salps appearing. Further down the peninsula, the two cartoons on the bottom, not as many changes yet, but we're moving in that direction. And uh, Hugh Ducklow thinks that we're headed that way probably in the next go 20, 30 years. What other things are happening? Well, one of the things that people don't realize is that there's forests in Antarctica. Uh, all you have to do to, to be in a forest is put your dry suit on with me and we'll slip into the water in front of the station and we will be swimming in a forest of seaweeds. There's 150 species of them. 
Some of them will be towering over your head, the blades 10 feet long. So this is a beautiful habitat that we've done a lot of our, our UAB research in, studying various aspects of these forests. I think the forests are going to do quite well in a warming world because what's going to happen is the sea ice depletion is going to increase the amount of light above the forest. They're probably going to grow deeper than they have in the past, and they're probably going to extend their range further down the peninsula. But we also know that these plants, these seaweeds, make chemical defenses, and those are dependent upon energy, and that the more light could result in more chemistry. That could have an impact on who eats what within the ecosystem. So there could be some trophic things that happen as a result of warming as well. What about the offspring of starfish and sponges and soft corals and all these marine invertebrates I studied? We call them plankton. We call them, I shouldn't say that, planktonic larvae. We call them larvae. And the larvae in Antarctica are unique in that they uh, develop very slowly. Uh, where a larva of a sea star uh, along the coast of California might develop in uh, three or four weeks of swimming around in the ocean. In Antarctica, it might be three or four months. Um, you can bring them in the laboratory, these larvae, and put them under warming conditions, raise the temperature maybe two degrees centigrade, and they'll develop instead of four months in four weeks. So they're very responsive to changes in temperature. They haven't seen these changes before. Um, and they haven't seen them yet, uh, but if they do, there could be some results or some impl implications for predation might be less because they're in the water column for a less, a smaller period of time. The other thing might be though that they are feeding larvae and phytoplankton in Antarctica bloom at a very particular time of the year. And these larvae might show up cafeteria and the doors locked. In other words, they're offset from the food that they depend on because their, their rate of development has been changed. This is something that climate scientists that work in terrestrial ecosystems or marine ecosystems are concerned about in the future is how predator and prey could be offset from one another in a, in a temporal sense. Um, who, other, who else is showing up at the station uh, besides the two penguins I mentioned, the chin strap and the gen tube? Well, elephant seals have arrived. They've been there for quite a while now, uh, it, in several decades. Uh, they have established a breeding colony near the station and having pups. You can hear them calling in the distance. And, and on a warm summer day, if there are a couple of males lounging around in the middle of the station, I've been told the odor uh, can be quite uh, a challenge. Um, these animals, again, are warmer weather species that are moving down the peninsula as it warms. The picture in the lower part is the Antarctic fur seal that was almost hunted to extinction for its fur coats. Um, it has now uh, come back in great numbers. It's a wonderful story of success. It, uh, they stopped hunting them in, I think, about the 1940s, and it, they really come back well. Uh, they are also showing up for the first time. They have not established a breeding colony, but I suspect they eventually they will. This is a, a picture of the Antarctic shelf seafloor community. Notice how rich it is, how abundant. This is a very old community of marine organisms that resulted from uh, Antarctica separating from South America about 45 million years ago. And about 20 million years ago, the Antarctic Circumpolar Current was established, and that essentially isolated the marine life in Antarctica. And those organisms that could adapt to the cold survived, and they've become endemic, if you will. Uh, and there are some species that didn't survive the cold. Um, there's some things missing from the Antarctic seafloor or the Antarctic Ocean. You don't see any sharks. There's no sharks at all in Antarctica. There are no fish with crushing jaws. All 250 species of Antarctic fish are wimps. They have weak little jaws and they feed on tiny little crustaceans. So nothing like a parrotfish. If you've ever been to the Caribbean and you've heard parrotfish crunching coral with those big jaws they have, there are no fish like that in Antarctica. There's nothing on the Antarctic seafloor with claw. There's no crabs, there's no lobsters. So the point of all this is that there are marine invertebrates in the system like clams and snails and things that have a shell. They've never had to deal with crushing predators. So if, you, if I was to hand your Dean Irwin an Antarctic clam, 
he could break the shells very easily with two fingers. They're, they're very thin, unprotected shells, uh, in contrast to what you pick up on the beach in Gulf Shores uh, that have a much thicker shell. So you can imagine the shock of my colleague, Sven Thatchy, who in 2007 came across for the first time in recorded history, uh, 13 uh, king crabs on the Antarctic slope below the shelf, uh, but nonetheless, for the first time on the shelf, um, I'm sorry, on the slope. And the concern here was that scientists had long known that crabs don't do well at low temperature. And as you go up the slope towards the shelf in Antarctica, the temperature actually decreases, it gets colder. Um, and that was thought to have kept king crabs at bay because they knew that they were in the deep sea surrounding Antarctica for a very long time, but they'd never been found on the slope. What happens is that when you take a crab, it doesn't have to be from Antarctica, any crab, and you put it in cold water, it has a very hard time regulating magnesium in its hemolymph, in its blood. And essentially that acts as a narcotic. So they fall over or they can't hit their mouth when they try to eat something. They're, it's like they're drunk, essentially. Um, so what might be happening then is that the deep Antarctic circumpolar current is beginning to warm and the physiological curtain is opening that could allow crabs to come up the slope. So we immediately wrote a big proposal to NSF and asked if we could study this phenomena, document the crabs, where are they, what are they eating, how are they impacting the system. And in the meantime, while the NSF proposal was being reviewed, uh, another group came across this population of one and a half million crabs in a very deep canyon, deeper than the slope even, uh, near Palmer Station. So we knew they were there, they were poised. Were they on the slope? Um, well, fortunately, we had two rounds of NSF funding to find out. And we took this ship three times for a month or two at each time to Antarctica. We leased a submarine from Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute, and we towed the submarine up the Antarctic slope onto the shelf in these 10 kilometer long transects with cameras on the front of the submarine taking pictures every 10 seconds uh, so that we could parse where the crabs were and how shallow they were, et cetera, et cetera. We had these tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of images after doing this at various locations up and down the peninsula a number of times. And as you well know, when you're a professor, if you have a ton of data, you use this instrument we call the graduate student. And uh, so we had graduate students analyze all the photographs. And it turns out there are, in fact, millions of king crabs now on the slope. Uh, where they are, some things are missing, like brittle stars. They might be eating them. Um, they have not reached the shelf yet. That's good. They're still several hundred meters below the shelf. But this is something that we're going to have to keep an eye on because they really could have a very dramatic impact on the whole ecosystem. As we know from the coast of Norway, where they were introduced by the Russians and moved down into the Norway coast, and the images of the seafloor as they come in are really draconian. It looks apocalyptic almost. Um, so the last thing I wanna mention is ocean acidification, the stepchild to climate warming, doesn't get near the press it should. This is where carbon dioxide that results from burning fossil fuels uh, ends up in the ocean. About 30% of it ends up in the oceans all around the world. And over the period since the Industrial Revolution, mm -hmm. the oceans have uh, on average increased about 30% in their acidity levels. Antarctica is the canary in the coal mine because the colder the seawater, the more CO2 is absorbed. It's a basic physical relationship. So you have the coldest ocean having the most CO2 and uh, we have organisms that are weakly calcified to begin with. So making a shell, sustaining a shell is a challenge already in Antarctica for these organisms. This is particularly so with things like this, the sea butterfly. The sea butterfly comes in a variety of different forms, including a naked one and a shelled species. This is the shelled one, it has a beautiful little shell made out of aragonite. It's very wafer thin. Um, these animals are as abundant as the stars in the sky. They are part of the global carbon cycle. They're so abundant, and yet they are beginning to dissolve their shells. You can see that today uh, if you collect them from certain areas of the Southern Ocean. So it's something that's happening. 
Our group has also been funded by NSF to work on ocean acidification in Antarctica. There hasn't been a lot of studies there. And we had two uh, students who spent, I think, three or four field seasons in Antarctica doing work with shelled invertebrates, uh, also crustaceans living in macroalgal communities. Uh, you can see the apparatus they set up where they regulate CO2 and, and sort of uh, set it at levels for the future to see what happens. And basically, the, the bottom line is they're finding, or we're finding winners and losers. There are some species that seem to do fine in a future ocean with CO2, and there are others that literally die. I mean, they don't do well at all. So uh, we're down, we're going down next week, two weeks from now. The research team will go back to finish another season of ocean acidification work to try to figure out the physiology of why they're dying. But what is it about the CO2 that's causing that to happen? So here's a laundry list of the things that are happening along the peninsula. Um, I won't go into great detail about this other than to say it's an impressive list. And it is happening very quickly. It is happening, uh, an ecosystem level change uh, is so dynamic that it's a threat. So this is what we're looking at in terms of the norm for millennia on the peninsula. You had a very dependable sea ice that appeared every winter. The Delhi penguin used it as a platform and the populations were, were robust. Um, you had krill, lots of krill. You had the seafloor community, uh, the forests, and all this being fed by this nutrient-rich water, uh, the Antarctic Circumpolar Current, or the ACC. So here's where we're headed, probably by mid-century, certainly no later than end of century. The sea ice is effectively going to be gone from the peninsula, the Delhi with it. Um, Krill populations will be lower. The Gentoo and the Chinstrap will be very happy and moved in. We might have crabs, we don't know, but they potentially could move up onto the shelf. The forests will have expanded, and again, all being fed by this ACC. So this is interesting to me because what it represents is a very dramatic change in a short period of time. And as you talk with your colleagues about climate change, um, you may hear things like, well, the climate has always changed. And they're right, it has always changed. But what's happening now is the rate of change is so different. We're talking about a rate of change that is going to result in a fairly significant uh, extinction event across the world. So it's not, it just explained to them that it's the rate of change and some organisms simply can't keep up. So why should we care um, about this in Antarctica? Antarctica, as you know, is remote. Um, and I always like to use the example of our drug discovery work here at UAB and our stuff that we found in Antarctica. And just very quickly, I'll mention a few things. Um, you know, when we're collecting organisms for our ecology, work in chemical ecology, we're always getting extra material uh, to extract chemistry from and then screen against cancer, cystic fibrosis. We've worked with the Cystic Fibrosis Center here at UAB, various bacterial infections, uh, various parasites. Uh, we work with a drug chemist, Bill Baker in Florida at the University of South Florida, uh, who is wonderful, one of the leaders in his field. So he has all these connections and we send them chemistry that we, uh, actual chemicals that we identify and also crude extracts to be tested. So this is one of the leads that's quite exciting. It's a chemical from a tunicate. Tunicates are on the same branch of the phylogenetic tree as we are. They just don't have arms and legs and they don't read books. Um, tunicates have a, a, a tadpole larva that has all the vertebrate characteristics. So that's why it's on our part of the tree. Anyway, it looks like a blob and they grow all over the seafloor in great abundance, and we extracted these things and found a chemical that we named palmarolide after the station. And we sent it off to the National Cancer Institute, and they got very excited about it. They called us up and said, it's really cool. It's, it's potent against one type of cancer, and potency and specificity are good things. Can we work on it? And we said, sure, that'd be great. So they used their researchers to first and foremost in natural products chemistry, make the chemical. You can't possibly go to Antarctica with huge ships and harvest this thing and bring it back and extract it. Uh, so they made it. That's not a surprise. 95% of natural products can be reproduced in the laboratory. But the bad news, 13 steps to produce it in the lab. 
So a drug company would go, ha, ah, that's far too labor intensive. So what we've been able to do that's exciting is we have now sequenced the gene cluster for pomerolite. And in theory, and this is the next step, is to stick the gene cluster into a bacteria and tell it to make pomerolite. And that would be really sexy for a, a drug company. So we could have a, a new drug to fight melanoma skin cancer from an Antarctic tunicate, and that's the type of drug we need. So that's exciting. The other thing we found that caused quite a hoopla was in dendrilla membranosa, the sponge. There's a lot of different chemicals in dendrilla, but the one that was really exciting is one that's active against MRSA in its uh, biofilm form. If you know anything about MRSA, you know that it, it occurs in two forms, an aqueous form and a biofilm form. If you're a surgeon, you know about the biofilm form, particularly if you do knees, because what happens is you put in an artificial knee uh, joint, it gets a biofilm, a layer of mucus and polysaccharides and proteins and things growing on it. And first it gets under the biofilm, it can't be treated. So they have to take out the implant, uh, clear the patient of the bacterial infection and redo the surgery a second time. And from doing the grand rounds here in surgery, that is happening more and more. So the excitement was that not that this was such a potent chemical against MRSA, but that it got under the biofilm. And that was the first compound to ever do that. And so we got like 5,000 downloads of the paper in the first week. I mean, it was, it was a big deal. So maybe we can learn about the mechanism of getting under the biofilm from that discovery from an Antarctic sponge. So now I do a lot of outreach uh, on climate change. And as you know, it's an interesting topic, sociologically, politically, et cetera. Um, I used to get asked this question, is the climate really warming? Don't get asked this um, anymore, or I haven't for a very long time. Everybody seems to have now realized that our planet is warming, uh, maybe a little more rapidly than usual. And I, you can go online and find data for global warming. And my favorite data set to prove global warming is this one. I think this, <laughs> there's absolutely no question that this is a very significant, uh, what we call hard data. Minus. Um, but I do get asked this question, probably will next week on the ship. Um, is, you know, is this warming have anything to do with us? Couldn't it just be a natural perturbation that the earth is going through and this has happened in the past? How do we know it's linked to us? So I have a wonderful way to, to address that because the data to prove this comes from Antarctica and it comes from that two mile thick ice that sits on top of the continent. And so what you're looking at here is an ice core. So the core is about the diameter of an orange. And this particular core is 3,600 meters long. So it goes through a lot of ice, okay? So you're drilling down through the Antarctic ice sheets. And as you go down, you're going back in time. And at the bottom of this ice core, you're actually, if you think about the, look at the image there, it's laying flat on its side. You're about 420,000 years ago at the bottom of the ice core, okay? And then it comes all the way up to the present, or approximately the present. So the really neat thing is that there are little bubbles of air that are trapped in the ice at the time that the ice was formed. And you can look at those little air bubbles and analyze the amount of CO2, and that's what's in the red line. And you can also indirectly calculate temperature, and that's in the blue line. But I want you to look at the red line because that's the greenhouse warming gas. And if you look at that big black line I've drawn across the graph, you can see in the last 400,000 years, that amount of CO2 has never been above 300 parts per million in our atmosphere. Now look what happens to the red line at the far right side of that graph. You know what that is? That's the beginning of the industrial revolution. And that has really shot up. In fact, this is dated. We are now up to about 420 parts per million. So more than that's about 25 plus percent that CO2, a well-established greenhouse warming gas, nobody questions that, has increased. And it's coincident with the burning of fossil fuels. So you make up your own mind, but this is very convincing to me that, that we have a smoking gun. How much of, it, of the warming is attributable to this? Um, I think a, a very high percentage, maybe not 100%, but it's not a tiny little percentage. And you were wondering why the red line goes up and down in 100,000 year cycles, weren't you? 
Well, that's called the Milankovitch cycle, and it has to do with the elliptical orbit of the Earth around the sun in a 100,000 year period. And that also really doesn't seem to be controversial. All right, so Antarctica and Alabama, climate change. Is it worlds apart? Not necessarily so. Um, you have the Antarctic circumpolar current. Those currents go around Antarctica and then they come up and they come up into the Atlantic and the Pacific oceans in the Northern hemisphere. Antarctica is a climate maker for us in Alabama, believe it or not. It affects the planet's climate um, in many ways. So you really can't separate it out from, from what's happening there. And so we're seeing things, I'm not gonna go into detail, but you may have noticed that in Alabama, we have hotter, hot, hotter, hot days. We have colder, cold days. We have more rain coming down per unit time than we used to, maybe not more inches per year, but when it rains, it floods. We have people who are drowning under 280 in front of St. Francis Hospital in flooded roads. Um, it is, we have sea level rise on the coast of Alabama now where people are having trouble getting insurance for their beach houses. So we are seeing a lot of things in our own state. And some of these are linked back probably to what's happening in the warming of our, our Antarctic currents. So gloom and doom, um, but I always tell my audience there's hope, and that's what I wanna share with you here, is the story of the Antarctic ozone hole, which is very hopeful. And it's an analogy to really to what's happening now. Um, so in 1985, a couple of technicians in Antarctica were looking at their data set, and uh, they looked at each other and said, you know, our boss in England isn't gonna believe these data. And they were right. They sent the data back to the boss and he said, you know, um, I don't believe the data. I'm gonna get you a new spectrophotometer and send you back to Antarctica for another year. And you're gonna have to repeat these measurements before I'll believe them. And they did, and they got the same story. And they published in Nature in 1987, uh, one of the most famous papers of all time, maybe of the 20th century, announcing this massive hole in the ozone over Antarctica that literally uh, the ozone layer protects us from ultraviolet radiation. It actually affects climate underneath it. If there's no ozone, the wind patterns are different on the land uh, and the ocean. So this was so big, it drifted over New Zealand certain times of the year, um, real big deal. But the even bigger deal was that it, within two years of the announcement of the ozone hole, 20 countries sat down around the table in Montreal, Canada and ratified the Montreal Protocol that regulated the chlorofluorocarbons, the refrigerants that were destroying our atmosphere. So this was phenomenal because today there are 197 signatories to the Montreal Protocol. The companies that made the refrigerants uh, used innovation to develop new chemicals that didn't destroy the ozone. Countries that couldn't afford the innovation were assisted by wealthier countries to do so. And the amount of these uh, ozone uh, destroying chemicals has re been reduced significantly. And Susan Solomon, uh, the scientist at MIT, who has told me, and she's the one that discovered the chemistry behind the lack of the destruction of the ozone, that probably it's going to disappear by mid-century instead of end of century, this hole in the ozone. So it's a very successful thing. People didn't lose jobs, they didn't go out of business, they didn't lose people to, you know, whatever, the economic situation has been fine. Um, so I think that it's a much bigger step, as you can imagine, going to CO2 from um, these refrigerants, but it is, it's feasible. We have the technology, we just simply need the will. And I think that that will eventually happen. So I'll just quickly talk a little bit about my outreach. Um, I do a lot of, climate change outreach. And one of the first things I was told is that I had to write a book in order to really reach a broad population about my work and not a book for scientists, a book for the public. So I looked into that and I found out to write a book, you have to have a literary agent. And then I found out to have a literary agent, you have to have a book. Ah, so <laughs> it's, it's a real catch 22. And that's where getting to know the right people helps. And uh, I was very fortunate to have befriended E.O. Wilson when I invited him here to UAB to be the Ireland Award winner. And we spent a week together. Nobody told me I had to take care of him the whole week and pick him up every morning and take him to lunch. By the end of the week, we were friends and he mentored me for several decades 
including getting me a literary agent. And so when my book, Lost Antarctica, came out, um, the E.O. Wilson Biodiversity Director, the Foundation Director, called me up and she said, Jim, we really like your chapter on the Adeli penguin. We want to use it for an, a film for a, a three or four minute video that will go into the zoos and aquariums around the country. It's a very poignant story about loss. And I, I thought she was hinting around that she wanted me to narrate it. She said, we really like the prose. We just wanted to have it read. Um, and uh, she said, I offered, and she said, no, 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 we don't want you. Um, and she said, we'll have, we'll have Harrison do it. And I said, Harrison, who's Harrison? And it turned out that Harrison was on the board with me. And so he, uh, he did the, the audio part of the, a uh, little, uh, it's on YouTube. You can listen to him reading from the chapter and he did, he worked very hard on it and did a really good job. So that was important for outreach. And the other thing that was important was meeting this guy. Um, I was in Antarctica one day minding my own business at the station and I was asked to host a visitor. And I said, who is it? And they said, well, you know, we can't tell you who it is. I said, you're crazy, why? And they said, security. I said, security, we're in Antarctica. <laughs> well, the next day, Bill Gates and his father, Bill Sr., showed up. Uh, Bill's father's uh, new wife was with him, and their son, Bill's son, uh, was there as well. He's about 10. So my job was to show them around the station, talk about the science that was going on, and after lunch, uh, take them up to the room with the big screen, where we show them the NSF film about what is the U.S. doing in Antarctic science. And I put, at lunch, I snuck up there and put two big chairs in the front of the room, one for Bill and one for Bill Sr. And they came up, sat down, and the IT guy came in and could not get Microsoft to boot up. <laughs> so that, was, that, that was my Microsoft moment. <laughs> I love that. Um, I take people to Antarctica, as many of you know. and. Uh, Actually, this is a little dated. Uh, I'll be taking a group next week. This is a record for me. I have 26 guests from Birmingham coming with me to Antarctica next week. I usually have 10. So for some reason, I don't know if it's COVID and people are, are now mortal, so they've moved up their bucket list to put Antarctica at the top, or they're interested in climate change, or they're worried about seeing Antarctica before it's changed too much. But for whatever reason, uh, I also learned that the number of tourists this year going to Antarctica will be twice as high as it has ever been. Uh, over 100,000 tourists are going to go to Antarctica this season. So I'm a little concerned about that. But at the same time, they do a really good job of policing themselves and making sure that uh, the environment is taken care of or I wouldn't be doing this. So if you have any colleagues or friends or if you're interested in going to Antarctica, I'm going to do this every December until I can't stand it any longer. Um, this is just an amazing trip. Um, I also am reaching out more and more to faith groups. I led a workshop with a Episcopal priest on climate change, had three days of meetings at, at uh, Camp McDowell with people representing five different denominations, and it really was very successful. And this is something in the Southeast that I think has a huge potential because we have a very strong faith community in the Southeast. And if we could harness that to address climate change and get it off the political agenda, uh, that would be massive. Um, so I do, I am encouraged, I get invited to speak at churches more than I used to. Um, this is our church that I go to with my wife who's in the choir, and we had the blessing of the solar panels, where the bishop actually went up in a bucket uh, above the church and dropped holy water on the solar panels to bless them. And this press came and 100 people came and it was it was a wonderful moment. Um, I also am now the national one of the national voices for the Nature Conservancy's Can We Talk Climate uh, campaign. So this is about speaking about global warming and climate change, which, as we know, can be very politicized. We probably all have uncles who are aunts who don't believe in global warming. And how do you have that discussion? Um, it's really interesting. There's, uh, there's what I, I like to think is that you have to find common ground. You can't be dogmatic. You can't be, you can't tell them to go buy a Prius. What you have to do is find out. Okay, they love gardening. Are the tomatoes 
coming in earlier than they used to? You know, uh, are the birds on your feet are different? If you can find some place to start the conversation, uh, so then you can make a little some inroads in talking about. Well, maybe that's. You know, I've had people at Rotary clubs come up to me very secretively after my talk and say, "I believe you." Um, <laughs> and the reason I believe you is I can't get insurance on my beach house, and something's going on. And so, so you have to find that common ground and then and then go from there. Um, and I'm also really pleased to be working uh, with Jeff and Paul and others here in the school on this endeavor to link or to build a program in climate change and human health, because I think that this is this is going to set UAB apart nationally. And it's so important. And often I find when I'm talking about the impacts of climate change, people are more responsive to human health impacts than they are penguins and polar bears. Um, so, and, and we all know that there are going to be significant impacts, heat on people, diseases that are moving in, all sorts of things. So I think that this is really an important move. Um, and I applaud that. And then finally, I'll just mention that um, I was very honored a couple of years ago to get invited to uh, the Explorers Club's dinner. This is a, a big affair in Manhattan with several thousand attendees. And uh, I was to receive an award for my work in Antarctica. And what was the true honor though for me was who I shared the stage with, which were the last eight living Apollo astronauts. And uh, at the end of the evening, each of the astronauts was asked to give a little vignette about something that had happened in space that they had never shared before with the public. And I loved the one story about this fellow whose wedding ring slipped off his finger in zero gravity and headed out to space. And the other astronaut was able to grab the ring before it, it ruined the marriage. And I thought that was pretty cool. But the moment that was special to me was Rusty Schweikert, who I put his name on top of his head. He's sitting at the end there. And Rusty was a pilot on one of the Apollo uh, missions. And Rusty uh, got very serious. And he looked down the road at his colleagues and he said, you know, all of us have been up in space and we all have a very special appreciation for this planet. Because when you go out there and you look back, you realize what an incredibly fragile planet this is. And this biosphere that's thin that surrounds this uh, planet really needs to be taken care of. And the whole audience was just really struck by this moment. And uh, I was too. So that's where I'm going to end. And I'm happy to take questions. Yes, Steve. Uh, what do you think the reason is for the differential warming from west to east in Antarctica? Good question. I think the reason for the differential warming is the Antarctic circumpolar current. That's the most logical explanation because the current is deeper on the east side than the west side. It shallows. And as that current is warming, it brings warmth with it. And so it's not as influential on the east side as it is on the west side. Now that said, there's another competing hypothesis that the hole in the ozone actually has changed the wind patterns and the ice patterns sufficiently on the east side to influence the lack of warming that you see over there. Not sure I buy into that as much. Um, it does also sort of make you nervous because you think, well, if we're going to get rid of the hole in the ozone, that means that the eastern side is just going to speed up and catch up with the west, which may be true. I don't know. But those are the two hypotheses. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, Paul. What, what, what are the next set of NSF funded projects that you want to see happen? In, in Palmer or Macaroto. Okay, that's a great question. Or 20 years. So what are the next things I'd like to see NSF fund in Antarctica? Um, I think it's safe to say now that it's rare to see an NSF proposal come across your desk that doesn't have some focus on climate now. Um, and we survived the Palmer administration, unlike some other federal agencies where they were told no climate research. Uh, NSF's Antarctic uh, and Arctic programs uh, went through there untouched. I don't know why, uh, but it is now very, very common that uh, every proposal is looking at some aspect of this because it's really the, like it is the canary in the coal mine. 
or climate change. And you see first impacts in polar environments because organisms that live in these environments are sensitive to very small changes, unlike organisms that live in temperate tropical climates where they're used to seeing variation. Um, so what would I like to see? I would like to see more of an emphasis on ocean acidification this, because uh, this is an area that's really important that has received very little attention. There are uh, certainly maybe uh, three or four of us that have been doing ocean acidification research in Antarctica. So there's a need for more of that. Um, and particularly at the ecosystem level, uh, how are ecosystems, you know, well, how do you study that? We're actually doing stuff now with ocean acidification where we have our seaweeds and small crustaceans that live in association with them in these mesocosms that have bubbling CO2. So we're looking at the community response to ocean acidification. Warming is a big deal in Antarctica, and there'll be lots of NSF work looking at the effects of warming on the physiology of, of organisms, particularly particulotherms that can't warm themselves. Um, the, the krill populations being followed uh, because they are so quintessentially important in the tropic food webs of Antarctica, krill is going to be a very uh, important part of that. Um, and then and I do, I do credit NSF quite a bit with encouraging Antarctic NSF funded people to be spokespeople because what we have that's unusual is Antarctica. And you can walk into a kindergarten or you can walk into a college or you can walk into a, a group of surgeons meeting for a conference and Antarctica is just fascinating. So I always felt I had a special obligation being funded by NSF to use Antarctica as a leverage to get people to think about what's going on with climate, what's going on in adaptation to you know, extreme conditions. I mean, the list goes on and on. And I'm happy to say that now when your NSF proposal gets reviewed, instead of two or three decades ago, um, they really take broader impacts seriously. You know, they really will nick you on funding you. If you don't, it's not just, I'm gonna take a grad student to Antarctica. I mean, I'm going to develop, we have UAB in Antarctica, a website, award-winning website that we've developed. It'll be in action next week. We're going to do it for the, I think, the seventh or eighth time. We had, we've had half a million kids in schools follow us to Antarctica on this thing. So it's photographs, it's blogs, it's talk, it's all right, little pieces about climate change. So the outreach component of NSF is important too, more so than ever, and getting scientists to talk to Congress and, and to people who can make make these decisions. I think it's going to be really important. Other questions? So you've been going to Antarctica for a while now. Right. Um, are there certain things that people there are doing differently daily lifestyle-wise to help preserve the climate? Yeah. Um, so I've, I've tried several times to get the directorship of NSF who oversees the Antarctic stations to consider making Palmer Station um, off the, the fossil fuel grid. In other words, to use solar, to use wind, because we have cruise ships coming to visit us all the time. I mean, just a great opportunity. And they've looked into it, never done it. However, I would give credit to the big station, McMurdo, where the New Zealand station next door and their brilliance built three large wind turbines. They were so successful in providing energy that the New Zealand station was completely run by them and they gave a third of the energy budget of McMurdo to us free. So in the new plan for rebuilding McMurdo station, there are two more wind turbines and that will be very nice to see them off the, because. You know, we have had kind of a checkered history in Antarctica. When I first went to McMurdo Station in the mid 80s, um, they were still not really managing their waste and doing things right. And Greenpeace showed up. They built a cabin up the coast and they would come down and leave trash on the director's doorstep in the mornings. And, you know, you think of Greenpeace as being this radical organization that might be a little bit too radical, but it worked. It brought attention to how America was treating Antarctica. And in the 90s, I watched millions of dollars invested in the station to 
clean up the waste. She, I mean, there, I, you go in the dorm, there would be 15 different colored cans for everything you can recycle under you know, They stopped burning. They start, I mean, it just completely, we became a model for the world in taking care of the Antarctic environment, which is very delicate. Um, in the old days, they used to bulldoze the trash off the edge of the sea ice every year into the ocean. I mean, that's, that was the way it was treated, and not just by the U.S., but all countries. So they've come a long way in that regard. Um, so that's a good thing. Yeah. And I think we'll just continue to go that direction. Other questions? Yes. So for our students, how can our students get involved? Well, you, you can, you can uh, I have two students that are gonna get on a plane next week and come to Antarctica with me. Um, they are paying guests on the cruise. I can't get them a free trip to Antarctica. It's just not feasible. But I have now, this will be eight UAB students I have taken to Antarctica. When I take UAB students to Antarctica on the cruise, they take a marine Antarctic course under my direction. They'll be gathering, gathering data, going to all the lectures, counting birds off the back of the ship. I mean, they're going to be working. They're going to be doing studies while they're down there. Um, so that's a great way. The other way is to involve them in our web program, UAB in Antarctica, to follow the trip, and you can build from that. Um, yeah, I just think it's a great teaching tool. Yeah. All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you. I don't know how to get it. 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 I